Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. We're very excited to talk to you about Splunk Investigate, the latest product that we released in limited availability as of this morning. Um, this is the customary forward-looking statement, which simply says that we could be talking about features that is not a part of a generally available release. So please do not make any buying decisions based on that. I'm Hema Mohan. I'm a director of product management at Splunk. Uh, I've been, been in the enterprise systems management space for the last 16 plus years. I've been with Splunk for the last three and a half years. And for the last 15 months, I've been working with an awesome team on Splunk Investigate. With me, joining me today is my colleague, Dan. Hi there, I'm Dan. I've been a front end software engineer for many years working on data analytics uh, user interfaces. And I've been working on Splunk Investigate for the last year. And I'm looking forward to showing you guys what we've been building. So we pretty much plan on giving you an overview of the challenges, the use cases that we plan on addressing, and who we built Splunk Investigate for, and then switch over to a demo. You got to see a brief overview this morning at the keynote, and we plan on spending at least 20 plus minutes walking you through the features in Splunk Investigate. So let's start with some data points. $8.2 million is what Slack paid out in credits to their customers in Q2 of FY20. That's because they breached their SLA of 99.99% uptime, which is pretty much four minutes to recover from an outage per month. That makes it eight seconds per day and one minute per week. The second data point, Uber pushed out an update to their backend API service, which brought their ride driver app down. So for every hour that they took to recover from this outage, 15,000 rides were affected. Third point, uh, iCloud had an outage earlier this year. They took four hours to restore the service. 2.3 billion users were affected during that outage. These are just three data points. I'm sure there are thousands of such data points that you can, you can just look up when you say an outage, you'll find many more uh, data points around how businesses are affected on a daily basis due to incidents and outages. We understand outages are expensive. However, why is it so hard to navigate what we typically call a war room scenario? Let me talk to you about an example that we saw with one of our customers. When an incident happens, uh, occurs, uh, it's usually a customer who notifies you, or an alert goes off, and you receive a notification. The on-call engineer receives a notification. And with the notification, you, you will get a link to a run book, which pretty much captures the steps to triaging the incident. So when an on-call engineer begins triaging that incident, he pretty much tries to remediate the issue, which is making sure that the users can recover, or you can restore the service for your users quickly. In Slack's case, you pretty much have eight seconds to do that in a day. And um, there's also a bunch of tools that you bring to an investigation. There's a Slack channel that gets opened. There's a Jira ticket, which you need to update because business stakeholders are asking you for an, uh, for an ETA. You also are working with applications that are built on modern complex architectures. We also have customers who are dealing with multi-cloud environments. And that itself asks you to bring in domain experts who bring their own set of technologies or tools. And you're all pretty much working independently on different tools. Finally, you manage to recover, restore the service. And you try to do a retrospective three days from your uh, incident. All your links have been updated. Dashboard links have been updated. Your data is as of today and not from three days ago. Your learnings are scattered over multiple tools. So you pretty much scrape through Slack. You scrape, scrape through Jira, Jira tickets and try to build a manual timeline to make sure that this incident doesn't occur again. And voila, what happened to um, Slack? They had the same incident back in uh, What they had in June occurred again in July. So these are expensive, but we are not doing a pretty good job of capturing our learnings from these war room scenarios. So if I could summarize the challenges of an incident scenario in three uh, steps, it's poor collaboration. Because let's, the fact of the day is there are going to be multiple users that need to come in and help you solve it, multiple experts with varying skill sets. And they are going to, today they are collaborating independently. And that is adding to the time taken to resolve an issue. And we're also uh, dealing with issues where data is spread across multiple uh, systems. 
and toggling between these tools is, a, is going to take away your time from resolving the incident. Finally, what, in, what most organizations are measured based on is number of repeat incidents, and you're not able to kind of resolve those, uh, you're not able to determine the root cause or uh, take actions on, what, on your learnings from that incident, primarily because your post-mortem or your retrospective process is ineffective. That's where Splunk Investigate comes in. Splunk Investigate is a cloud-based solution, and our primary focus is to help you remediate your issues quickly. And how do we achieve this? Uh, if I could just give you two bullet points, it is by providing a collaborative investigative interface where you can invite users into the same interface and also store and leverage all the artifacts from your investigations. This could be indexes, this could be queries, this could be dashboards. Everything focused on making your investigations faster. The five, four main capabilities within Splunk Investigate is we, we understand that your data, during an investigation, you may choose to bring data from different sources. It could be pre-production data, it could be pro production data. Our intention is to allow you to make, it e to make it easy for you to bring data in quickly. And second, there is a smart knowledge object library. When I say knowledge objects, I'm talking about dashboards, I'm talking about queries. We have often dealt with customers who've said that their organizations suffer from tribal knowledge. There's an SRE who worked on an investigation previously and has stored all those queries on his or her computer. They use a text expander, and if, if that SRE was not invited to this investigation, you pretty much are dealing with tacit knowledge here, so that adds to the time taken to res resolve an incident. So knowledge object library not only allows you to annotate the data that you bring in by providing a description, but it also allows you to save queries. We've seen saved queries in Splunk Enterprise previously, but this is different. We don't, you don't have to schedule these queries to run. This is just a library of all the queries and all the information that you have. You can also uh, invite different users to what we call as uh, workbooks or the collaborative investigative interface. And we understand people, um, there are various domain expertise that is required for an investigation, and people have different levels of skill set. Not everyone is going to be uh, proficient in SPL. So what Workbooks offers is a uh, ML-driven smart search assistant, which guides these users to build their own queries. They can also import dashboards or queries that were previously constructed. And finally, there is also the SQL-based query language that's, that we call as SPL2, which is a format that you understand, which is the SQL, co uh, SQL construct, but also the power of SPL. And you can also save all this information to do, we can freeze your workbooks. But we can freeze the results and the queries, so you can pretty much leverage this for your retrospective. And finally, we understand that once an incident is resolved, you want to continue keeping an eye on that incident for a couple of hours or a couple of days, so you can build out those visualizations through dashboards. You can either watch them standalone or import them into workbooks. And all these capabilities are built on top of a scalable cloud infrastructure. So we understand the need of the day. We have provided a multi-tenanted platform that just allows you to, that, that's made it easy for us to build these capabilities. So with this, I'll hand it over to Dan to talk, to give you a demo. All right, thank you, Hema. And let me just get myself set up real quick here. All right. I'm going to start here by showing you what my setup is, and then I'll sh we'll go through the uh, actual demo. I'm using uh, sim data, which basically takes or makes simulation of different databases, users, and web servers interacting with one another. And to start an incident, I'm going to actually just go ahead and move that to zero so that we get some uh, errors coming through the system. All right. Um, that data is being sent into my instance via HTTP. Um, but we also support Splunk forwarders and uh, file uploads, and we also have various AWS connectors as well. And then I give this pipeline that you can see here that is built upon DSP. And then if I go into the actual investigate interface, this is the data library, the knowledge object library that Hema was referring to. And here I can see the different indexes and views and other artifacts that I've built. This is a relatively new um, tenant, so there isn't much info here. But if, for example, I were to check out this index, I can see that this is pretty old and 
doesn't have that many events, and this is probably not the, where the data is going. So if you've ever done like index equals star or had some of your users do index equals star trying to find the index where the data is, is the, knowledge the knowledge catalog gives you a great way of looking at what data is available to you so you can see. So here's the main index, and we can see that the data here is flowing in immediately, and we've got a good amount of data. So this is actually where I'm sending the data right now. And I can start an investigation by just going to open that in the workbook here. So my scenario is I just got a VictorOps notification that we're seeing an increased number of 500 errors coming from our servers. And my job is to figure out where those errors are coming from, why they're coming, and fix the situation. And so when I start here, I'm just going to go ahead and run a from main search to see what the data looks like. And you know, I might not do that in a production instance with a lot of data, but in this case, it's OK. And then I can use this field summary to learn a little bit more about my data. In this case, I only get the basic extracted fields, but I can enable field extraction to get a lot more uh, information out of that. And then once that runs, I can look through here to see what some of the interesting fields are. There's like disk usage, there's the various queries that are getting run against the databases, there's the users that are interacting, the web servers. But my VictorOps notification was about a 500 errors, so I'm interested in this code uh, field. And sure enough, I notice here that we do have a good number of 503s, which isn't good. And by clicking into this, I can actually create a subsearch to look into what those errors are. And here's the first thing I want to emphasize. This is an iterative search based on the parent search. So my parent search could be a very long running. In this case, I just did from main. And there's not so much data here that it took that long to run. But if I wanted to then build a search on top of it and not rerun that base search, I can actually just iterate on this tail, on this child, without rerunning the whole thing. So say, for example, I don't want to see just the 503s, but I want to see all 500 errors. I can do something like this. And this is just going to rerun that child search. It's not going to rerun the base search. So I don't know if you've ever had a large query that you're trying to build out, and the base of it takes a long time to run. And you go, you know, you run your search, you go grab a coffee, you come back, and you look, and it's like, oh, I need to actually tweak this a little bit. And so you tweak that. You run that search again, and you go to the bathroom. And so it's a cycle that's very, very slow. And so what we're trying to do here with the child search interface is make that cycle much, much quicker. I don't need to rerun that base search in order to iterate on my child searches. And then those child searches can go on and on. So I can create another child search off of this one. So say I open up the field summary again. And I want to see where, you know, I see a lot of 500s, but maybe they're, are they um, to a specific server? And here we see definitely this uh, web server 56 seems to have the bulk of those errors. So I can click into this to create another child search and start to look at what all those different errors are. And here we see service is unavailable, which is not a good indication. Um, well, let me, let me take a step back. I want to actually look and see what the different errors look like over time. So I'm going to create another child search from that error search where I actually want to just do a time chart. And I'm going to look at the web server name and run that. And that should tell me what the data looks like over time. And this confirms it. Web server 56 really has a spike right here. It seems to coincide with when I started this demo. And um, we have an elevated errors there. So I'm going to go ahead and do the fastest thing I can to remediate this, this issue. I'm going to slide my slider over to the right here. And that should remediate the issue, but I haven't actually solved the underlying issue. So what I want to do now is share this workbook with the broader team, with other domain experts, and actually dig deeper into the underlying issues and actually solve the underlying issue as opposed to just restarting the server, as we did in this case. Um, excuse me. So, in order to do that, I'm going to prepare my, my workbook a little bit for sharing. So I'm going to give it a title. Right now, it's just untitled. So I'm going to say this investigate invest 500 level errors. And then I'm going to go ahead and share that with my folks here. And then I could copy that link and send it to the people that may be having domain expertise on the things that I'm looking at. And then the next thing I'm going to do is actually start another search looking into what's going on here. 
actually, before I start looking into what's going on here, I want to validate that what I've done has actually fixed the issue. And so, in order to do that, I want to export this time chart search as a view so that I can reuse it later, because it seems like a very useful chart to do. So if I save it as a view, I can see the entire query, not just the child search. I'm gonna give that a more useful title. Time chart of all the errors by web server, something like this, something useful. All right, and I close that. And now I can import that from the catalog by selecting a views here. And then in the modal, you can see I can browse the other artifacts that are in the catalog. And in this case, though, I do want that view. I just go ahead and select that. And now I can run this search again. And so notice by default that this is based on the global time. This global time is locked to the incident time. And so when I run any search, by default, it's gonna be running on that incident time. But I also have the ability to break away from that time and apply any time. And so in this case, I wanna actually confirm that the issue has been resolved. So I wanna see the last 15 minutes from now, not the actual incident time. And the hope here is that the data will show that the errors have severely declined since the uh, actual incident. And let's go ahead and see that, and awesome. It does look like it has come down significantly since that actual incident. Cool, so I'm gonna go ahead and call this, you know, confirmed issue resolved. Awesome, and I also wanna write in here, has an artifact, how I resolved the issue or how I remediated the issue. The issue wasn't actually resolved. We don't know why there was a spike, but we know that restarting the server remediated the issue. Let's see what web server that was again. Web server 56. Web server, restarted server 56 to around. All right, so now I wanna create another search to actually look into the errors that were happening on web server 56, and I'm gonna help get some help from some of my uh, colleagues here to understand what's going on with that data. So um, here I'm gonna to try to show off a little bit of that SQL-like syntax that Hema was referring to. So I do from main where web server name equals quote um, web server dot no, web server, was it 56? Let me double check that. Yes, 56.splunk.com. Go ahead and enter there. And I could run that. Once again, I'll open up that field summary. I'm gonna actually enable field summary to get a little bit more information. And that'll allow me to poke around and see if there's any anomalies here, or anything interesting. Um, so let's look at like render time. It's very weird that we have a lot of render times of one. I'm not sure what's going on there. Also query time of zero for a good majority of the events, that also seems really weird. I don't really know much about databases though, so I'm gonna go ahead and phone a friend on this one. Uh, let's see, that's Siri. And by the way, Siri is not a um, Apple device. Siri is a colleague that I work with who is an awesome engineer and much better than that computer software that Apple writes. All right, maybe while she's uh, looking into that. Um, the other thing I wanna do here is make sure that I monitor the situation over the coming days here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my time chart that I've created and export that into a dash bar, dashboard. Um, okay, errors over time, let's just call it. And if I go ahead and create a dashboard, I could come back and see that over here. And I'm gonna go ahead and edit this dashboard and make that a little bit wider because it's a little bit too narrow for me to look at. All right, okay, cool. So now I can have this up over my, uh, on my monitors and you know, make sure that this situation doesn't come back again. It looks like things are stabilized for now. All right, if I go back to my investigation, oops. Let's go down to where we are. Oh, here we see, okay. Oh, thanks Siri, Siri's looking into it. Okay, so now let's go ahead and say that Siri and I and maybe any other domain experts have looked into the air and we found the issue and the issue was actually here, 
So I'm going to go ahead and take a screenshot of this and I'm going to add this to my workbook as an artifact that we can have for later. And so I can add an image panel here. Add that screenshot. And then I could annotate this and say something like, uh, well, I'm going to use red for this to make it sure it's clear. And say, keep the slider on the right. Don't keep it on the left. That's how we fix this issue and that's how we're going to prevent this from happening again. Give some exclamation points there. Awesome. All right. Now we can call this issue resolved. We know that we have to keep the slider on the right and so I'm going to go ahead and mark this one has resolved. All right. Oops. I clicked escape and not enter. That was the wrong thing. All right. So now this thing, this workbook can be used as an artifact when we do a post-incident report however long down the road, we can come back to it. So if I go back to my, um, my workbook listing page, I did a test demo of this yesterday, I can go back to this and all the data is exactly as it was when I was looking at it yesterday. We can see that the time frame was from 21 hours ago and all of these time ranges are the actual data I was looking at at the time I was performing that investigation. So when we're doing our post-incident report, we're not looking and trying to recollect all the different artifacts and all the different things that we may have seen at the time. We can just look at exactly what we were looking at at the time the incident happened. Here we see once again that there is elevated errors and then all the errors that were coming through, we can still browse them, et cetera. And then once again, we see that it was remediated. Um, so that's how we can use Splunk Investigate to both address an issue quickly and then respond to it and use it as a post-incident report to prevent those errors from happening again. All right. <laughs> so, how is it? Yeah. Okay. So we have two more slides before we open it up for questions. Uh, we did mention this is a new cloud-based solution. So this is how we plan on packaging Splunk Investigate. There are going to be three tiers uh, that will be available soon. As of today, you can start accessing the starter tier. Uh, we've slightly deviated from the ingestion-based pricing that Splunk is used to. So we will be using a user-based pricing. There's a 14-day trial that you can sign up for. And most of the, what, whatever Dan demoed today is available in the product. So you can sign up for the trial, explore the features. Growth and deluxe packages will be available in the coming future, in, in the near future. So we don't have an ETA on that. Uh, so what's the call to action? You can get started with Splunk Investigate today. Sign up for a free trial. You can provide your own. We are going to provision the tenant for you, and you provide the name. You can bring your own data, or you can also use our sample data. All right. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. I thought you had a lot of questions. Yeah, I do. I guess, like, a lot of questions. Asmita, do you want to be our, yeah. or? Is there... Uh, sorry, uh, first time on a speaker. Uh, so how is the machine learning integrated into Investigate? Great question. So while I, so the, the functionalities that we showed you, the first part of machine learning that's in the product is um, the smart search assistant, and it is ML-based. So we've been spending a lot of time learning from how users construct their queries, and we've started building our smart, smart search assistant based on machine learning. There are additional functionalities that we're building out, we understand there are uh, ML-specific use cases that you can use in an investigation. For example, you, you care less about what your data looks like on a regular basis and more about the anomalies. So we're working on patterns, and there's also going to be recommendations. What did my data look like yesterday? Uh, what did my data look like last week? So we're going to start building out those uh, features as well. That's in the works. As this is a cloud product, we just uh, need to turn on the feature flag as soon as the, the feature is shipped. So is it something that's paired with Phantom, or is that native to Investigate? This is, that's going to be native to Investigate. Phantom integration is, going to come, is, is coming down the pike, but that's mostly for actions and orchestration. So okay. if you notice some, um, so what Jan, Dan just showed you was to restart a service. So we plan on providing Phantom integration so that you can 
uh, run those actions from a workbook. Awesome. Um, so with the child processes, uh, like as you're working through the investigation, uh, are you able to come up a level within, like, can you make a child as if you're actually coming up a level to include more items? So say you see, like, HDB traffic on this port, but you're like, okay, uh, do I want to see if this kind of anomaly is happening on more ports and open up that traffic to broaden your scope? So as it currently works, you'd have to go back up to the parent search and then add another child to that. There's not a way to sort of get more data from the parent than is already existing there, if I'm understanding the question correctly. So is it something that'll be annotated within your search, how it goes like one, two, three? Will it be like one dash one, one dash two? Show the search tree. Yeah, let's go ahead and show the search tree on that. Um, that's a great question. And so as these get more complicated, there's going to be more relationships between the searches. And so what we've implemented is this search tree that shows the um, relationship between the different chart, the different search panels. And so as you can see, you can have multiple children of any of these panels. There's sort of an infinite tree that you can have here. And you can then navigate it with the search tree here. Does that kind of answer your question? Or? Yeah. Cool. So this should be good. Um, and I guess, uh, so for the UBA package, uh, I'm still learning how like the purchasing works with all this. Uh, is this included? I guess, like, how does the packaging this with this? standalone, people? completely different. Okay. I think that's everything. Cool. Thanks for the questions. Can you have another question here in the middle? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so for the, uh, the pricing model, you said that it was based on users. Is that users of the Splunk instance or users of this specific standalone product? Users there? of Splunk Investigate. OK. OK. Yeah. Thank you. I had a quick question regarding, you mentioned earlier, I think you referred to Victor Ops. What, what's the correlation between Victor Ops and Splunk Investigate? You want me to take that? Or you want to answer? Um, well, I I could try to answer, and then Hema can uh, correct me if anything. And so one of our near-term goals is to have integration with VictorOps. So you get a VictorOps notification that you could then be taken directly into a workbook with some context available with you. Um, so that doesn't exist yet, but that is like near-term on our roadmap. So what we're, uh, what we're planning to achieve is an end-to-end -end incident response experience. So we want to make sure that there is uh, VictorOps integration so that the response is taken care of by VictorOps, and we help with the remediation resolution. And uh, I believe with VictorOps, we can also do a pretty comprehensive retrospective. Uh, I'm interested in the, uh, your, your workbook, Investigate. You said that um, you store all the results, comments, pictures, is that KV store stuff, or how are you? Because I'm really interested in pulling this stuff up six months, yeah. three months later, hey, we had that problem, and here's how we did it. I so, have a lot of customers doing that. Yeah. And so that, where are you actually putting that information? Yeah, so the, this is built on top of the Splunk Cloud Services. And whenever you create a search job in the Splunk Cloud Services, it's automatically stored as a job artifact. And that job artifact is essentially a data set. And then that data set can be searched just like other data sets. And so it's somewhat of a new concept to the Splunk Cloud uh, Services platform that we're, we're leveraging here to provide that functionality. And then the text and the image panels are actually stored entirely differently, sort of in or specific to the workbooks. Those are stored in S3 or um, a ProScore database. Uh, Perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. Is this available to uh, those who have uh, on-prem Splunk and implementation only? Is there going to be a gateway or anything? Great question. We've just answered it about 1,500 times since yesterday. <laughs> uh, we, we plan on bringing this, um, at least the collaborative aspect of this, onto Splunk Enterprise in the future. For now, um, the cloud platform that we've built it on made it possible for us to kind of leverage the data catalog that we built on it. So this was just the trial run, but we've got a lot of feedback around the investigative experience. So uh, the Splunk Enterprise UI team has been made aware of all the requests that are coming our way. So they do have it on their roadmap. Great. And to add on to that prior question, would it be possible so that, because we have a, a different uh, service desk uh, that's completely separate from Splunk, can these be accessed via like a URL that we could embed in a master ticket incident in our uh, service desk application? 
Which service desk tool do you have today? Uh, it's from uh, Avanti. Okay, so we do plan on building out a couple of integrations to start with, that's Jira and ServiceNow integration. So the, cha the, the text panel that um, Dan showed you, we want to provide you an update to kind of, uh, uh, you know, if you put in a text panel, that will automatically update the comment section in Jira or in ServiceNow. But for other uh, integrations, we plan on exposing the API in the future. But if you're asking for a URL for the workbooks, we want to also make it shareable where users can just access the workbook in a read-only mode, uh, that's, that's in the works. Yeah, again, just for documentation of yes. how we fixed it before. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. We've got another one up front. Thank you. Um, so looking at Phantom, they kind of had a like storyboard, and you could issue tasks to people. Uh, so in Investigate, is there a similar storyboard type thing, or is it just kind of going through the child processes? Like, uh, is there kind of like a single dashboard? I guess maybe that term might be wrong uh, for Splunk. Uh, but is there kind of like a, a one-stop shop for being able to see the investigation as a whole? Um, so some of the things that we've been looking at, and I think this is something that we'll have to address, is sort of like how do you see the whole thing, especially as it gets long and, and get more details into it. And um, we have some ideas around sort of a like contents table and various ways of summarizing it, but uh, that's still a work in progress and we're still working through some of those thoughts and ideas. So do you believe that's going to be paired with mission control as like uh, being able to create like a subset within it? Not, not really. So this, the way we envision Splunk Investigate to work is people care about the chronological order in which they arrive at the investigation. So it's less about one dashboard and more about the steps that were, uh, the steps that you took to arrive at your resolution. And, uh, and Mission Control is a separate application on top of uh, the Splunk Cloud Services platform. So we right now don't have any plans of integrating with it. But like I said, with Phantom, we definitely plan on uh, providing the, the orchestration and the actions that you can take. Um, and you mentioned like each of the searches, uh, I guess like creates a, uh, like a unique identifier. Um, mm -hmm. I guess like, is that something that you would could compare to some of like, not necessarily like an MD5 hash, um, but is it like a unique string that like if you shared that out, they could search it within investigate and it would pull up that exact search? Yeah, actually that's exactly how it works. Um, under the hood, we're doing, you just saw me doing these from uh, main or from anything. And so when you run a search on the Splunk Cloud um, Services platform, it creates a data set and then you do get an ID back and then you can do a from that ID to actually further investigate any of that data. And so yeah, if I were to, and I don't have an ID off the top of my head, but I could theoretically just run like from, you know, job ID here and then continue searching it just like that. Is that able to see what I'm doing there? Yeah. So I guess besides that, um, not just that, uh, I guess in that same context, can you literally just put like just that string in there and then it would pull up the exact search, I would Which, assume? Oh yeah, so if you just did from the job and you didn't actually do anything further, then yes, it would return the results of that uh, job, exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, does a, a Splunk in particular have a user role base? The user role base? Um, so right now, we're, that's a work in progress, and we don't have complex um, permissioning yet, but that's something we're working on in the near-term future. So um, the, is, like, you have a, like, uh, a workbook. Can you able to share uh, the workbook to the other analysts? Yeah, exactly. So you can share this. And so right now, we have a very simple permission system. The workbook is either available to everybody in the tenant, or it's available private to, to yourself. And um, we're working on more granular permissions where I can share it with very specific people or I can share write position permissions or read permissions. But right now, it's just a Boolean, shared or, un or private. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for the question. Um, real quick one, just uh, since I know many of my investigations go down rabbit holes, is it easy to rearrange things just to hide and say, yes, we went down that rabbit hole, we looked at it, but anyone coming back later on doesn't have to uh, see it front and center? Yep, exactly. And so there's a few different ways we can do this. For the visibility, you can, for example, hide different things to kind of show that, like, okay, you know, if I want to show this again, I can. 
um, but it also can hide things so that you don't have to take up all that vertical space with it. We also have um, a toggle, or yeah, toggle here in the, in, that I could um, change that. Um, yeah, I can change the vertical height, and then of course we also have panel reordering. Yeah, I just click there, and so I can change the order here too if I need to. We also have a lock lock option. So mm -hmm. if there was a base search that established this is where your issue occurred, and you don't want other users to come and modify that query or the time range for you, you can lock the panel. However, they can clone it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Ismita, for sticking yes. around Sorry. and making you late for your own talk. No, this is my workout for the day. I could yell, too. Um, how about uh, uh, integrating to messaging platforms like Slack? Do you want to talk Great about question. That? So uh, we are currently working on a bidirectional integration with Slack. What that means is you add a comment here, it'll show up as a DM. And if you respond uh, along with like a deep link to the, to the panel in which you added the comment, and you can either click on it or you can respond on Slack and that will get appended as a comment to the panel that you um, used. In the future, we also plan on providing a Slack add-on, which means you should be able to execute commands from your Slack uh, bot itself. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us and uh, checking out our product. And uh, if you're interested, check it out online. Siri's got some uh, literature for you. And, uh, yeah.